Well, did you see the big mound of dirt out there? Anybody walk by that? That's kind of exciting. We've got a brand new building going up right now, the Armstrong Center, which will house a beautiful new chapel, library, music center. It's going to be fantastic. So we've got that building going up right there right now. I know parking's limited, so thank you all for your patience with us as CCU expands, which is very, very exciting. Well, welcome. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Centennial Institute here at Colorado Christian University. Welcome to our April issue forum. Will increasing gun control improve public safety? We always like to start with a word of prayer and a pledge. So please welcome CCU students Hannah Harrison and Daria Nichols. Good evening. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to gather tonight and to discuss such an important topic that weighs heavily on our hearts. As we discuss the Second Amendment and the right to defend ourselves, we pray that you'll be with our speaker and that you'll give us wisdom as we discuss this tonight. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, and let's begin the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Daria. Daria is the president of CCU for Life. And in fact, tomorrow, if you're not aware of this, we're doing a, we're participating with a whole bunch of groups. There's a rally at the state capitol, 10 a.m. to noon, um, kind of against all these radical abortion bills that are taking place out there. But CCU for Life is one of CCU's biggest clubs. It's Indicative of our commitment to the sanctity of life here at CCU. Well, friends, as Colorado seeks to pass ever more restrictive gun laws, the most important question to ask is, will increasing gun control improve public safety? Will all of this matter? Does it make a difference? We've been passing gun laws since 2013. And I'm reminded of a story back in 2021, we decided to help create uh, these little documentaries for the Western Conservative Summit. We couldn't host the big event down at the Colorado Convention Center. And so while we were coming out of COVID, we said, let's go create some documentaries that we can showcase throughout the summit since it's going to be a smaller audience. And we went up and took a, a film crew to Lauren Boebert's restaurant, Shooter's Grill. And we went out to a gun range with Lauren Boebert. And then afterwards, we went and had steak at a restaurant, and we had about 40 people with us. It was a lot of fun. And meanwhile, um, while we were at her grill, she was the one that cooked all the steak for us, which was kind of fun. I've never had a member of Congress actually grill a steak for me, but she did it. And I was pointing out in our documentary, you can watch it on our YouTube channel, that everybody there was wearing a gun, the whole restaurant. And that's kind of what they're known for, right? All the servers are wearing guns on their sides. And I pointed out, I felt safer in that restaurant with all these people wearing guns than I would be in a city with restrictive laws that would prevent law-abiding citizens from owning guns, right? You just, I felt safe. There, there was a gun there and a gun there, and there's guns everywhere. And I felt pretty safe about, around there. So we had originally planned this as a debate, this evening to be a debate, but couldn't find anyone to debate Dave Koppel. No activists, we asked him, no professors, we asked them. We even asked the lawmakers down at the state capitol passing the gun laws to come up here and debate Dave Koppel on this, and none of them agreed to do that, which is kind of a sad reflection of the left's unwillingness to debate policy. And I think you've seen it even further on display at the capitol as the majority is implementing this Rule 14, which is limiting the amount of debate already taking place down at the state capitol. That's relatively unheard of in Colorado history. Friends, we need institutions to debate ideas in the Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University is happy to be that institution. Now, it is a strategic priority at Colorado Christian University to impact our culture in support of the sanctity of life. That's a pretty broad term. We like life. It's good. God creates it. We want to protect it. And at the same time, the original intent of the Constitution. We seek to protect life and protect the rights guaranteed in the Second Amendment. I agree with Justice Scalia's assessment 
that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that arm for the traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. This was in District of Columbia v. Heller. I further agree with Justice Thomas that, quote, the constitutional right to bear arms in public for self-defense is not, quote, a second-class right subject to an entirely different body of rules than the other Bill of Rights guarantees. That's in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. How do we balance the desire to promote the sanctity of life along with protecting our Second Amendment rights? We must be very serious about protecting innocent people from mass shooters and seeking to reduce gun violence. This includes hardening soft targets like schools and churches, which the Centennial Institute works on with our fellow Jimmy Graham. We must promote strong family formation, which is key to raising young, thriving, healthy young people. While we work to reduce gun violence and mass shootings, we must recognize that the Second Amendment has created the world's largest standing civilian army. Like nowhere else in the world do you have so many people committed to individual freedom with the power to defend individual freedom. As our world faces growing totalitarian threats, a well-armed citizenry is crucial to our nation's freedom and liberty. To explore these issues this evening is our speaker, Dave Koppel. Dave Koppel is a research director, is the research director of the Independence Institute, an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute in Washington, and, and an adjunct professor of advanced constitutional law at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. He is a frequent panelist on Colorado Public Television's Colorado Inside Out and a columnist for Reason Magazine. Koppel writes a con on constitutional law, criminal justice, civil rights, firearm policy, international affairs, technology, politics, environmental policy, and the media. He is the author of 20 books, hundreds of newspapers and magazine articles, and 119 scholarly journal articles. He's appeared in a lot of places, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times. Among his journal publications are articles in journals from Yale, Harvard, NYU, the University of Michigan, John Hopkins, Notre Dame, and the University of Pennsylvania. This is very impressive. His briefs have been cited by U.S. Supreme Court Justices Alito, Breyer, Kagan, Stevens, and Thomas, and by then Judge Kavanaugh as well. That's a pretty big accomplishment. I was reading just recently and a tribute he wrote to his mother, who was also a lawyer. Both his parents were lawyers. I think they'd be very proud of you with all those citations, Dave. He's been also cited in 29 Federal Circuit Court of Appeals cases, 15 U.S. District Court cases, and 28 state and territorial appellate cases. He wrote the book, The Samurai, The Mountie, and the Cowboy, Should America Adopt the Gun Controls of Others Nations, uh, of Other Democracies? and it was named the Book of the Year by the American Society of Criminology. Before joining the Independence Institute, he served as Assistant Attorney General here in the state of Colorado, dealing with the enforcement of hazardous waste, Superfund, and other environmental laws. He holds a JD magna cum laude from the University of Michigan Law School and a BA in history with honors from Brown University. That is a lot. We're very blessed and honored to have Dave Koppel with us. Please welcome our guest, Dave Koppel. Thank you for that nice introduction. Well, th this being Colorado Christian University, I want to start by talking about a few important Bible passages. And what I'm going to say is, is derived from my book, The Morality of Self-Defense and Military Action, the Judeo-Christian Tradition. And these are a few passages that have been very influential in, in our Judeo-Christian civilization in attitudes about arms and self-defense. Under the... Uh, uh, mosaic law set down in the, the Torah, uh, the nearest relative of a person who was murdered uh, was obliged to kill the murderer um, and thus providing uh, blood restitution for the death of the innocent. But there was an exception when a, uh, by the text, when a nocturnal burglar was killed in the act, there was no wrongdoing and thus no obligation or right of restitution. 
Um, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be no blood, sh blood shed for him. So what did that mean? It meant the, you might think it was a distinction between nighttime versus daytime burglary, which was something that existed in Roman law. But the, the Jewish interpretation of the sun passage uh, was always uh, serious but not literal. What it meant was, regardless of the time of day, if the burglar is reasonably perceived as a violent threat to the people in the home, then they can act with deadly force, if necessary, in self-defense. And on the other hand, if, if not, then not. So if your wastrel father, if this is an example from a commentary, if your wastrel father, uh, who you know would never hurt anybody in the family, uh, you find him breaking in so he can swipe your silver and buy some more booze, uh, you can't kill him for that act of attempted theft. But on the other hand, if uh, a stranger's coming in and you don't know his intent, then, then you can use force in self-defense. And this passage from Exodus 22 was uh, one of the passages that influenced a rule in the, the Talmud, a, the huge body of, of commentary on, on Jewish law that's always been very central to Jewish thinking. Um, and that rule is summarized as, if someone comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. In traditional Jewish law, self-defense is, is not a choice. It's a positive obligation. God gave you your life. You have a duty to defend it. And you likewise also have a duty uh, to defend others, uh, such as specifically uh, victims of attempted murders or, or attempted rapes. Okay, let's move to the New Testament. So early in, in Jesus' ministry, he told the disciples, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Then at the Last Supper, Jesus revokes those instructions and has something different. He asked, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, the apostles replied. And then he continues, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for that, that which is written about me has its fulfillment. And the apostles respond, look, Lord, here are two swords. And uh, Jesus says to them, it is enough. Now, so Jesus obviously wasn't setting up a rule that everybody has to carry a sword or a knapsack or a money bag. The broader point is that... Um, He's going to be gone, at least in, in one sense, um, and they're going to have to take some responsibility for, for taking care of themselves. Uh, but the passage does show that the apostles, two of them, uh, were carrying swords uh, while they were following Jesus, uh, most likely um, the 16-inch six, classic Roman uh, military sword of the times, fairly short and, e and easy to carry, uh, concealed, and they were apparently doing it in violation uh, of the uh, Roman law of the time that subject people uh, couldn't have arms. Okay, and finally in chapter 13 of Paul's epistle to the Romans, um, he tells Christians to submit to civil governments. Let every, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained by God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the, the, the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Whatsoever ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continu continually, continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, these seem like pretty strong and absolutist words, but clearly Paul himself um, didn't always believe them in a, uh, at least in a, a statutory interpretation kind of sense because he and, and the other apostles 
constantly uh, violated Roman religious laws uh, by preaching the gospel. And uh, when he responded to a law that against gospel preaching, preaching uh, Peter and the other apostles responded, we ought to obey God rather than men. So one of the big, but this passage, which I cited, was commonly cited, say, in 700 or 900 AD, as saying, no matter how bad the government is, you just got to go along with it. Um, you know, the, however awful the king might be, you have to submit to the king. But starting in the second millennium, uh, Christians began to take a different attitude on that, and to view Paul's words, I say, with, with more nuance and... Uh, conditionality. And so they would say, well, let's set up the government that's ruling us now versus the one that Paul described, said we should obey. And if they're pretty similar or not that bad, then fine. But if not, not. So here's an easy way to, to go through the, this is the way the uh, second millennium Christian thought did. Just take the name, instead of saying rulers in general, just put in the name of a particular ruler. I'm going to use Stalin in this example, but you could use Mao Zedong or Hitler or Fidel Castro or, or Mugabe or lots of others. For Joseph Stalin is not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Well, that's false. He terrified the good and promoted evil. For Joseph Stalin is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For Stalin beareth not the sword in vain. For Stalin is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon whom that doeth evil. Well, in fact, Stalin did not minister to the good. People who did evil under Stalin prospered, and do-gooders uh, were persecuted. He wielded the sword uh, not to, ex to uh, execute wrath on evildoers, but to murder uh, over 60 million innocent people. And so thus, the, Paul's instructions in Romans about obedience can't apply to the people who are subject of tyrannical regimes. The language, by its nature, uh, certainly does not forbid uh, resistance to tyranny. And that intellectual change I just described over the course of the second millennium was, among other things, something that was an absolutely necessary uh, precondition for the American Revolution. As uh, John Adams said, as long as the people thought they had to obey the king and pray for him, uh, you know, then they were... Uh, subjects of the crown, and when they changed their mind and saw, began to see him as a, a danger to their religious liberty, among many other things, that's the change in the American population mentally, that then later, the, the mental revolution that later made the physical revolution possible. All right, so we're here to talk about whether firearms, uh, how firearms affect uh, public safety, and I'm going to try to look at a broad picture rather than talking about particular gun control laws. And of course, there, there can be good gun control laws that reduce violent crime and don't infringe on people's rights. And there can also be bad laws, which often do the opposite. Um, and, but that, that's sort of a case-by-case -case matter. But I would say, certainly, if you've spent as much time with the legislature as I have, and I'm, I'm sorry if you're in that situation, um, you can find that a lot of the testimony, and particularly the, from the, the sponsors of the anti-gun bills this year, yes, they can talk about the little details in their bills, but they, what they, they are motivated by is that guns, too many guns in general is a bad thing, and so if we can do this or that or the other thing to reduce guns one way or another, that's the positive thing to move towards. The, the guns per se, and certainly American levels of gun ownership, are very bad and they want to do something about it however they can. So let's look at uh, the sweep of American history and go back to 1948, which is the first year for which we've got the data I'm about to tell you about. As of 1948, in America, there was about one gun for every three Americans. That is equivalent to the, the gun dance, density, gun per capita rate uh, that you'd currently have in some European nations, uh, such as, as France or Italy. Now, since then, the number of guns in America has increased. And, you know, you can find some years where it's bigger, that the increase is bigger than others. But since 1948, it's pretty been much been going, that slope's been going up. 
uh, without a lot of change. Maybe it accelerates a little one year or decelerates a little the other year with, due to political circumstances or whatever. But it, it's been a pretty steady increase the whole time. And so we now have uh, about four guns per three Americans, or one and a third guns per one American. So we have roughly quadrupled the per capita supply of guns in the United States. And that's a figure that it excludes the military, it does include, it does include police ownership of firearms. So we've had a huge increase in the number of firearms per capita. And if the anti-gun hypothesis is right, well then we should be having lots more problems with guns per capita. Let's take a look at the data on that. Since 1948, the per capita death, accident, death rate from firearms accidents has declined by 91%. For accidental death rates for children, that's ages 0 to 14, it's declined by 92%. So we go down over 90% per capita in firearms accidents, even though we quadrupled uh, guns per capita. The, uh, the firearms accident rate kind of peaked in the uh, early 1970s and then, then has, has declined since then. For homicide, the particular categories of murder and non-negligent manslaughter, while the firearms rate ownership rate has always been going up the whole time. I'm going to describe the different the changes in the United States on the homicide rate as it's gone up and down. As of 1948, it was 5.6 murders or non-negligent homicides per 100,000 population. So 5.6. 5, 5 it continues to fall in a fairly gradual way, reaching a low point in the fours around the mid-1950s, slowly rises up again, um, and then really starts rising in the mid-1960s, hits a peak of 10.2 in 1980, so almost double what it had been in the, in the late 1940s. Then the homicide rate begins to decline in the 1980s. Maybe that's a result of the, the tough-on-crime policies that uh, of the Reagan era, hits a low of relative of 7.9 in 1984, and then perhaps as a result of the, counter, the counterproductive war on drug users, uh, the rate begins to increase again, gets up to 9.8 in 1991. And all this time, it's gone down and then up and then down and then up again without any apparent relation to the gun supply, which just keeps going up and up and up. And then in the, around the early to mid-90s, homicide in the United States and violent crime in general began a significant decline. And that was a part of a trend that was going on uh, in many other uh, in advanced industrialized uh, nations. And that happy result kept on going in the early 20th century and all the way to about the middle of the last decade when in, in 2014 the homicide rate hit a low of 4.4 equal to the lowest rate of the happy years in the, uh, the mid-1950s. And again, the, the gun supply had been going up the whole time. Now, since 2015, and first starting in urban areas and then spreading more generally, we have seen increases in the homicide rate. And the latest data have it over a rate of over, of over six. Um, so what we've seen, and th there's lots of reasons for that, which I but anyway, whatever the reasons are for these rises and declines, the gun supply seems to have nothing to do with it. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, and now we're up again. Uh, but the guns just keep going up, up, up. So if there was any relation between the gun supply and homicide rate, it sure doesn't show up in the homicide rates. Uh, they, they appear to operate uh, entirely independently. And what I've just said is consistent with the data uh, when you compare jurisdictions within the United States or when you compare European countries against each other. When you, you find the places that have the most guns are not necessarily the places that have the most homicides. It doesn't seem to be an important variable when you do, do proper social science studies that account for other variables which, which we do know uh, have significant effects on crime, rate, crime rates such as what percentage of the population 
is in the, those youthful years of late teens and early 20s when crime rates peak. What are the poverty levels? What are the consumption levels of uh, things that are disinhibitors to violent crime, such as alcohol or cocaine, and, and lots of other factors. And when you do those controlled studies, you don't find much of a relation. And then it's true in Europe as well. The countries with the highest level of gun density uh, compared to some of their neighbors with much lower levels, there's no particular relationship showing that the higher gun density uh, causes more homicide. Now what I just said, so we've talked about accidents and homicide. The suicide picture is more complicated. It's also simpler in some ways. It's pretty clear now, one of the things social scientists agree on, is the higher the gun density in any given area, the greater the percentage of suicides that will be committed with firearms. So that's not the total suicide rate, but the percentage of suicides committed with firearms is very closely tied to gun density. So in this way, the uh, anti-gun legislators are accurate in thinking, oh, it kind of doesn't matter what gun control bills we pass. Just pass anything that says gun control, and that will have some inhibiting effect on law-abiding citizens owning guns, and maybe it won't affect the criminals, maybe it'll even make crime worse, but it'll reduce gun ownership by the law-abiding, and therefore, that will reduce gun suicide by the law-abiding. That, that is true. And in fact, there are some social scientists who, when they're trying to do studies that, est well, when they're trying to estimate gun density in any nation or state or, or city or, or whatever, they use the percentage of suicides with guns as their proxy uh, for gun density because other measures like, you know, sales and things like that can be harder because there are underground markets and uh, thefts from the military and all that. But so there's, there's no doubt that gun control reduces the percentage of suicides that are committed with guns. Now the interesting question is, well, okay, great. Do you actually then reduce the number, the total suicide rate, or is there a substitution effect? And this is something where social scientists differ. But I would say, it, and there, you know, there are good arguments on both sides by by eminent scholars analyzing the the data and, and doing different studies, but the, well, excuse me one sec. At the, at the least, we can say that to, if, if there is a suicide reduction, and I'm, I'm not sure there is, but there, but I wouldn't, but I'm not sure there isn't either. It's a, it's much less than the total reduction in gun suicide. And that is partly because there are other almost equally lethal methods available, and they're not ones that are particularly hard to find. Uh, the two leading of those would, would be hanging and jumping from a height. So anyway, that, that's the deal. We, it's, it's possible that, that gun control may reduce by, by significantly reducing gun suicide, might reduce to some extent total suicide, but we're not really sure about the answer on that one way or the other. For example, in uh, the, two, the two first states that enacted red flag laws, which are partly, uh, when, when properly carried out or include among their targets, people who, who may be suicidal, and so you want to disarm them at least temporarily, Indiana found a, a Indiana study found a reduction in gun suicide that was not matched by an increase in suicide by other means. Conversely, Connecticut found a gun reduction in gun suicide, uh, but an equally large increase in suicide by other means. So the the answer is I don't know. Now let's look at the the final part. I'd like to talk most broadly about uh, risks and benefits to society. There is, and one of the sort of key points that uh, gun control advocates make, which is intuitive but has something to it, is, you know, look at the United States. We've got, compared to, to Europe, 
we've got relatively lax gun controls, and we seem to have a lot more gun homicides uh, than they do in Europe. I wrote a, a whole book about that. My first book I wrote was about that topic, and also about other countries such as Japan and Jamaica, Australia, New Zealand. It was the, the samurai, the mountie, and the cowboy. Should America adopt the gun, the gun controls of other democracies? Um, and my, my bottom line answer is you've got to have laws that, that fit the society. So uh, Japan, which is uh, very cooperatively authoritarian and top-down in many ways, uh, the people, gun control fits there because it, it's a reinforcement of what is in this, the social consensus already. But that's not necessarily going to fit in the uh, uh, American society, which has very different uh, assumptions about individual rights and, uh, and group authority. But so let, let's take a look at the data in some more detail. The most complete country-by-country -country study of gun homicide uh, is, was published in uh, 2018 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it has an enormous online uh, uh, data table, data tables that go with it. So I took a look at the U.S. gun homicide rates for the, I wanted to study the 20th century as a whole. So looked at the U.S. gun homicide rate for the 1990s compared to the Eastern and Western European gun homicide rates. And so here's what we get uh, in terms of rates in the, this is for the 1990s. Uh, the average and this is, a, it, it's age adjusted, but you, you can skip that part. Um, the European average uh, was 1.35 gun homicides per 100,000 population versus the US average of the 90s, which was 5.06 uh, gun homicides per 100 population. So in other words, in an average year in the 1990s, per 100,000 people, there were 3.71 more gun homicides in the United States. So let's just, uh, for the sake of argument, um, and because there's no better data, take that 3.71 difference and extrapolate it backwards for the entire century. Suppose that if the U.S., in this hypothetical, the U.S. had, in starting in 1899, enacted European-style gun control laws, and that those laws led to a reduction in gun homicide in the U.S. And then we can just take the, the census data figures and apply that 3.71 difference year by year. Now, in doing that, I made some assumptions, all of which were intended to bias the figure upward. So I assumed that there's no such thing as a gun homicide that saves anybody's life. Like you killed the criminal who was about to kill the four people in your family. That, that, that never happens. I likewise assumed away any other benefit of gun ownership such as deterring or thwarting uh, other violent crimes. And I also assumed, and again, I assumed that there were no lawful uh, gun homicides in the United States. Nothing, every, every one of them was a bad homicide. So with those figures, which I, I think the, the point is, I'm not underestimating the, uh, the US-Europe gap by making all these assumptions against the, that the, the US gun ownership has zero benefits. But you take that 3.71 annual difference, extrapolate it through the US population, uh, figures throughout the, 20, the 20th century, and you get 745,000. That is the figure, using these assumptions, of how many fewer gun homicides there would have been in the United States compared to Europe if we had European gun, gun controls. And of course, this, is, this also assumes that there's no substitution effect, that every criminal who killed someone with a gun would not have, there never would have been a single instance of a criminal using another weapon uh, if the European style gun controls had kept that person from having a gun. Well, 745,000 is a pretty large figure. But it is, however, smaller by an order of mag two orders of magnitude than something else. And that something else is the number 
of Europeans in the 20th century who were murdered by their governments, which is a figure, the figure of that is over 86 million. In the United, in the figures I'm about to tell you about murder by government do not include war. Battlefield deaths, of which, you know, there have been a lot in World War I and World War II in Europe, and among other things, are not in these figures. Soldiers killing soldiers doesn't count. We're talking exclusively about governments murdering civilians. Here are some of the figures for government murders of civilians in the 20th century. Leading the pack is uh, the, the so falsely named People's Republic of China with 87.6 million, uh, the vast majority of those occurring in the Mao years. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, 61.9 million. Germany and the Nazi regime, uh, 20.9 million. That, that's not counting the battlefield deaths they caused. Uh, the uh, Chinese government uh, before the revolution, uh, 10 million. Japan under the military dictatorship, 6 million. Um, and it goes on and on with uh, Poland, 1.7 million, 1.6 million in the uh, ethnic cleansing they did after World War II. Uh, and lots and lots of other countries, 1.4 million in Mexico during the, uh, the civil wars and the, uh, the warlord days there in the first two decades of the 20th century. Romania, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Bulgaria, Hungary, Spain uh, under Franco. It's a, uh, a long and depressing uh, list. So we've got um, over, over 200 million globally, 86 million of those uh, in Europe, for which I was careful to like not count uh, the fraction of the Russian population that, that Stalin murdered uh, that was in uh, uh, Asia, which is about 23%. So the reason I'm alive today to speak to you here is because in the 19th century, my Jewish, German, and Jewish, Lithuanian ancestors emigrated from those countries and came to the United States. And by making that move, they significantly increased the chance that they or someone in their descendants might be killed by a criminal with a gun. They also, as it turned out, tremendously reduced the risk that they or some of their descendants would be murdered by a criminal government. And of course, that risk did come true in, uh, uh, with the, uh, the Soviet and, uh, and Nazi regimes in the mid-century. So the likelihood that a government will perpetrate mass murder is very closely related to the type of government you have. Totalitarian governments kill the most. Highly authoritarian governments come, come in second. Lesser authoritarian governments come in third and democratic regimes last. And one of the things about democratic regimes is, you know, you, you can look at history and, and see where some democratic regimes have killed large numbers of people overseas, but they don't kill people internally. They don't kill voters. Um, there's no case in history of a democratic regime perpetrating mass murder by the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions against an enfranchised population. So as long as you've got elections, real elections going on, you don't really have to worry much about mass murder by government taking place in your own country. So you can then point and say, oh, well, swell, great, we've had elections, you know, ever since uh, 1788 when, uh, uh, and even before that. Uh, so we got nothing, nothing to worry about around here. And therefore, we can go hog wild on gun control because um, even Copel says it might reduce gun suicide and you know, we don't need to resist a government that's trying to kill us all because that's not going to happen because we have elections. The problem with that sort of uh, shallow view of American exceptionalism is it doesn't, re doesn't 
account for the fragility of self-government in the world over history. You go back to 1900 and then go through the following century. There's currently 196 nations in the world. Of those 196 nations, how many remained free, you know, democratically ruled, republic, whatever word you want to use, and self-governing for the whole century? There's only eight of them. Australia, Canada, Iceland, New Zealand, Sweden, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and the United States. You got eight out of 96. And if you want to move the figure up a little bit and throw in uh, the countries that since decolonization have stayed both free and independent and, and self-governing, you, you can add a handful more of, of those. Israel is actually the largest one and then you've got, so in, in Israel is a small country, and then you can, there are a number of uh, island nations in the, in the Caribbean and the Pacific. You could add to that as well. But it doesn't look all that, you know, the, the odds are, are against you um, in thinking that. So this, of course, doesn't mean that every nation that has gun control, or even extreme gun control, is going to have uh, mass murder. So. The Netherlands were free, self-governing, democratic, not mass murdering for almost all of the 20th century, other than those four years from 1941 to 1945 when the Nazis ran them. And now they're back to their same old gun control policies, which is you know, essentially assuming, well, the past 65 years have been pretty good, so we'll just assume we can have a straight line extrapolation you know, like they'd assume they could have a straight line extrapolation of their happily independent status they'd have ever from 1648 up until 1941. But it's, it's arrogant for any country uh, to presume that they're always going to be immune. And America certainly has a lot of cultural and legal guardrails against a dictatorial government, but they're not infallible. And I worry that they are weakening substantially. You have, in the past two presidential elections, we had false claims of stolen elections, won by partisans on each side, which a lot of people on each side believed in, very, quite foolishly and with, with no factual basis, in my view. We saw the authoritarianism worldwide in the COVID pandemic when free governments, including in the United States, copied the Xi Jinping model of locking down society, something that had never been done before in the history of Western civilization. Yet we've had quarantines, uh, you know, we're, we're having an epidemic in, in uh, Naples, everybody who's sick, you got to stay in your house. That's different from saying everybody is well, you got to stay in your house. You, you, can't, you can't operate your business. And that, that got pulled off. And with, with some resistance, you know, varied place by place in America and some in some other places. But overall, the uh, uh, lockdown authoritarianism uh, was pulled off uh, fairly successfully. And you can look at the cultural changes. Uh, Anti-Semitism, when I was growing up in the 1970s, used to be a, uh, uh, something that everybody agreed was bad, uh, but and not, not only in the United States, but you, know, you can look at the United Kingdom where an, an outright anti-Semite like Jeremy Corbyn uh, was elected to the head of, of one of the major political parties. You can look at the rise of anti-Semitic incidents around the country in the United States and, and elsewhere, the, un, under the pretext of being anti-Israel, uh, but that, that's a fairly uh, thin pretext. And more and more people on the political left and on the political right disrespecting the Constitution, wanting some strong man to rule by executive decree rather than through the constitutional process of passing laws in Congress. And same thing as uh, in the book of Samuel, 
when uh, the Hebrews, with our, their fractious uh, tribal confederation, uh, got tired of all the trouble that was causing, and it had caused them a lot of trouble in, in some ways, and they said, uh, give us a king so we can be like other nations. And Samuel says, well, if, I, if you ask God to do that, you're going to get what you asked for, which is the king is going to subjugate you. You're going to be taxed up the wazoo. Your children are going to be his servants. We're going to have a lot of slavery, and you'll all be groaning under his yoke. And the Hebrews go, well, we, we want one anyway. And, and they got that. And, it, and, you know, maybe Solomon and David were, were pretty good in some ways for a while. Uh, but after that, the government went, went downhill, and the, uh, you got Jeroboam and, and a whole string of other bad kings. So if we're not immune then the argument is, well, okay, so fine. So maybe we might have a totalitarian government. But it's not like if we had arms, that's going to do any good. You know, like, what are you going to do? Like, run out in the, the streets with your Saturday night specials and start shooting at the government tanks? Well, no, definitely not. And resistance to mass murder by government is rarely in the form of overthrowing of d domestic victims, uh, overthrowing a regime. I mean, certainly the Jews in... Uh, Germany, as 2% of the population, couldn't have overthrown the Hitler regime uh, during the, almost all of its years of power when it was uh, generally supported by the German people. And you, you've probably never sat down with a yellow legal pad and said, okay, well, suppose I did want to like murder 10 million people and, and I was in the government. How would, I, how would I go about it? You really haven't, you, you probably haven't even gotten to step three and you're thinking about that, and, and good for you for not thinking about that. But, but not everybody is so nice as you all, and some people do think about that. And one of the things we see consistently for the governments that do think about that, and also the governments that think, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not like Hitler and Stalin. I don't want to murder 10 million people. I just want to have an absolute dictatorship where I rule autocratically, I soak up all the money in the country, everything is me, 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 but I'll only kill people to the extent my political opponents are. I'm not gonna go clean, you know, wipe out some ethnic group. I just wanna be a totalitarian despot, even if not a mass murdering one. Sort of, uh, to some extent, the, uh, the, the, the Castro model. Even for those guys, there's a fairly straightforward playbook that they have, and one of those is First, take the guns. The mass murders don't start when the victims have arms, and nor do the worst features of totalitarianism until the people have been disarmed. That's why one of the first things Castro did when he took power was to confiscate guns. That's why one, the same thing Mao did, the same thing the Nazis did, although they, they had their German legalistic sense and were able to basically just use the existing German gun control laws to ensure that only people who were, in their view, highly politically reliable could, could say, have a, a hunting gun. Soviet Union, on Idi Amin in uh, Uganda, on and on and on, you find a near universal feature of non-murderous tyranny and of highly murderous tyranny is first get the guns because they understand, they're good at their jobs, which is being a, a, a tyrant. And around the world, they understand that if you want to do that, you can't have the people able to resist. Same thing back in uh, uh, the days of, as Aristotle writes about, uh, when a tyrant wanted to take over Athens, the first thing he did was uh, deliver some ruse of saying, we're gonna, okay, I'm gonna give a big, big speech, you come, come over here to listen to me speak. Oh, you can't hear me, come closer, come closer, but leave your guns over there while you listen to me speak. And then while they were all listening to him speak, his cronies rounded up the gun, oh, rounded, not their guns, their spears and swords and things like that. And he said, oh, by at the end of the speech was, uh, you're all disarmed now, and so don't worry about the government, I'll take care of all, the, all of that myself. Um, Adolf Hitler, explain the necessity of disarmament. The most foolish mistake we could possibly make would be to allow the subjugated races to possess arms. History shows that all conquerors who have allowed their subjugated races to carry arms have, have prepared their own downfall by so doing. 
Indeed, I would go so far as to say that the supply of arms to the underdogs is a sine qua non for the overthrow of any sovereignty. So let's not have any native militia or native police. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote about the same thing in the Soviet Union. That is, if only the people had resisted when the NKVD was rounding them up and breaking into people's apartments to haul them off in the middle of the night to the, uh, the gulag, if even the people in the apartments had just rallied with their improvised weapons at hand uh, and, and fought them with fire pokers and things like that, they all would have died, probably, eventually. The secret police would have come back and killed them all. Uh, but it would have been a deterrent uh, to the secret police. You know, the secret policemen, just like everybody else, want to come home from work at the end of the day. You know, maybe they're out rounding up the Jews and putting them on cattle cars, uh, but they still want to go home and, you know, have a nice dinner. They don't want to die in their job. They're not that fanatic about it. And so if you increase the odds that some of them who are sending, coming out to mass murder people will themselves die on the spot, it's harder to find people to do that job. Here's what Ronald Reagan said. When dictators come to power, the first thing they do is take away the people's weapons. It makes it so much easier for the secret police to operate. It makes it so much easier to force the will of the ruler upon the ruled. The gun has been called the great equalizer, meaning that a small person with a gun is equal to a large person. But it is a great equalizer in another way, too. It ensures that the people are the equal of their government whenever that government forgets that it is servant and not master of the government. Now, what are the prospects of success? Well, sometimes once you've got a totalitarian government in power, uh, which might have disarmed most or all the population, things can be tough and the good guys often lose. But sometimes they succeed. For example, in the early 1990s in uh, the Sudan, uh, in the, the Nuba region, uh, the Sudanese, the, the People's Army there, uh, was the target of genocide by the uh, Islamist regime in Khartoum, which at various times tried to kill almost all the different ethnic groups there. And as one, uh, and they were cut off from the world. They had no, no support. As one writer put, they had no resupply, they had no vehicles, no heavy weapons, and sometimes only had a handful of bullets each. There was no humanitarian presence in their areas. There was no news coverage. Facing collective annihilation and with nothing but themselves to rely on, the Nuba people found the necessary determination and reser reserves of energy. And even though they lost a, a lot of territory, they managed to maintain a impregnable mountainous base area and prevent the genocide from taking place. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire perpetrated genocide against Armenians, Assyrians, and other Christians in Turkey. Uh, there were a lot, of arm, a lot of battles, and quite often the defenders would end up holed up in some siege or some uh, fortified church and eventually get starved out or they'd run out of ammunition and then they'd all get massacred. Uh, but not always. Uh, the, arm, the, the armed resistance against the uh, Ottoman genocide made it possible for over 200,000 victims to escape to Russia. And uh, in some cases, they were able to, the, the victims were also able to just repel the attackers or the attackers, you know, partly being busy fighting World War I, uh, just left to do something else. During World War II in Eastern Europe, a single Jewish partisan unit, the Bielski brothers, saved over a thousand Jews. Armed revolts in the cities, and most famously in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, didn't save the lives of any of the fighters. But those revolts did show the world that the Jews were not just victims, they were allies fighting in the common cause against Hitler and deserved a share of the post-war settlement. And there is a direct line between the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt and the 1948 establishment of the State of Israel a state where the Jewish people today are well armed. And so from 1948 onward, Israel has repeatedly defeated wars of Jewish extermination launched by near, nearby tyrants. Tibet, having been self-governing for many years, was invaded and conquered by communist China in 1941. Sorry, 1951. And the uh, after some initial happy talk, the Mao regime began imposing the same genocide, this, well, the same program, 
including mass murder, on Tibet that it did on, on China itself, which is essentially uh, wiping out religion and enslaving the people to work on government slave labor camps, supposedly collective farms, uh, where the, the people did all the work and the government took all the crops um, or, uh, or farm animals. And resistance has started almost immediately. Tibet actually had quite a strong uh, gun culture, although it was a lot of matchlocks and other arms that Americans in 1690 would have thought were obsolete. But there was a strong arms culture in Tibet. The Tibetan people rose up and resisted, and for a time they liberated hundreds of thousands of square miles of Tibet. They were ultimately defeated by the Chinese army, even though the Tibetans were man for man by far superior fighters, but they were defeated for the same reason the barbarians defeated the Romans the, uh, and or the American Indians uh, were defeated uh, by the American uh, immigrants. Uh, it was simply a, a sheer force of numbers. But in that course of the Tibetan resistance, um, they allowed, that made it possible for 80,000 Tibetans to flee to Nepal and India, including for the Dalai Lama himself to escape and thereby keep alive for the world the spiritual mission of Tibetan Buddhism and to share to the world what you all know about now, which is the oppression of Tibetans in China, which was something hardly anybody knew about in 1957. So even though uh, fighters don't always win everything, they can still accomplish uh, quite a bit against uh, uh, mass murdering governments. Now again, I'm not saying that this means that every gun control law is necessarily a bad idea. It sure does suggest that gun registration laws are pretty dangerous because over and over and over and over again, registration laws are used by, for confiscation and that includes registration laws that were enacted by well-meaning democratic governments such as the German government in the 1920s or the French government in the 1930s which they thought, oh, the registration will help keep guns out of the hands of extremists. Well, what happens when the government becomes the, falls into the hands of the extremists and they use those registration lists to round up the firearms from everybody who's not a, a minion of the government extremists? So I would suggest to you that the history of our country and of the world shows that there's always a danger of people who want a government that is stronger than the people. And the history shows that that can be a fatal error, a gateway to mass murder by government. And so the best principles of our Judeo-Christian civilization and of our American Constitution, including the Second Amendment, tell us that in the long run, a society where good citizens is armed is much safer than one in which they are rendered defenseless. Thank you. Questions? CCU students will be carrying the microphone around. We'll start over here. Dave, I have a question about a bill that's in the legislature right now that would allow victims of gun violence to sue gun dealers, gun manufacturers. In 2013, there were uh, gun reforms that were passed and we saw gun businesses leave the state. It was only a few of them. But what kind of impact do you see that bill having should it pass? So that bill is, at, at, as of this moment, is in a conference committee to, with differences between what passed the House and the Senate. So we'll have to see how, how it turns out. But let me, let me put it in a broader perspective. Since the 1980s, the gun ban lobbies have been frustrated by how little progress they make at getting laws enacted by legislatures. And that you know, includes you know, in the 80s or, or 90s, uh, there was no judicial enforcement of the Second Amendment, so that wasn't even getting in their way. They just couldn't get the votes um, from the people who had been the legislators who had been elected. And so they aimed to end run that by bringing uh, tort lawsuits 
against firearms businesses and saying, you know, in essence, well, maybe we can't get a law passed to ban handguns, but we can sue Smith and Wesson out of existence. And that ramped up around the turn of the century when Andrew Cuomo, that our, 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 perhaps the most ethical public servant of our days, uh, as uh, Bill Clinton's uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, helped to organize a bunch of municipalities to sue the over about two dozen, over two dozen, uh, to sue firearms manufacturers, and they they got some of the tobacco lawyers to come and do it, and they admitted, you know, in the press, quoted, that we don't have to win any case, the sheer cost of litigation can wipe them out, and so that's the strategy, and and what's going on in Colorado is an attempt to revive that strategy. And Dave, on that point. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but it's not just gun manufacturers. It's anything associated with uh, gun crime could be sued. So some no. of the lawmakers were saying that, you know, even your shoes, the shoemaker. Well, right, yeah, right. It, it's, I mean, it's certainly it's all the retail. It's everybody you'd think of in the normal chain of business. Mm -hmm. And there was an interesting, uh, uh, in the House Judiciary Committee, some testimony where the lobbyist for the Firearms Policy Coalition, a, a national organization said, because the, the bill specifically includes components. So what about flashlights? You know, if, if any of you have bought rifles or handguns lately, you may know that there's a lot of rifles and handguns that come with rails or mounts that are equipped for flashlights, which is a great thing if you're, you know, some people, obviously there's different theories, but a lot of people favor that uh, for home defense at night, or for that matter, for, you know, predator control uh, on, on farms and ranches at night. So if you make a flashlight, you know, the hardware store that sells the flashlight that somebody puts on a gun, are, are they part of this too? And the, uh, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee eventually uh, decided that it was time to end the questioning of the witnesses when they couldn't come up with a, uh, a response to that concern. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, let, and putting aside the Colorado bill, which is in its current form does have that language, you've got things in California, the, the law that says it's illegal to do advertising, you know, that a child might see. So all these, you know, wholesome things we saw you know, over the decades of, you know, yeah, a, a 22 single shot rifle is a good choice for a boy or a girl's first gun, you know, under mom and dad's supervision, all, all those kinds of things, those become illegal. And that, that, that's another part of the point is, well, we, we can't do anything about all these grown-ups now who have guns, but if we can clamp down on the kids, you know, make it illegal to even touch a gun, except under certain cir limited circumstances until you're 21, well, then you'll have fewer people who get in, young people who get interested in the shooting sports and in hunting and in all those things. So over the long term, we can constrict uh, people who support gun ownership. I mean, they... Uh, the, the Bloomberg lobby hires, hires un, unlike Donald Trump, they really do hire the best. They have the, the nation's best PR firms. They have outstanding lawyers coming fresh out of Supreme Court clerkships. And so they do a very good job of thinking strategically over the long run. And what you said is, is part of that. Let's go to another question. Go ahead, here. Wait for the microphone so folks online can hear. Um, you, you mentioned a lot of studies that base their uh, outcomes on how many guns are owned by citizens. How in the world do they have any idea how many guns, I mean, of course I don't own any guns, and he doesn't either, and he doesn't either, but maybe somebody over there does. How would they know, and I know they can go off sales, but aren't, I mean, a lot of guns are passed down through families. I'm not sure how many guns are ever gotten rid of, ever. Oh, it, it, probably not? few. I mean, yeah, some of them. Some of them will wear out and never get repaired. But no, you're you're right about that. And in chapter one, the first set of my, my co-authored textbook, Farms Law and the Second Amendment, uh, we have a chapter on the social science, and that's a huge problem. You know, for for anybody who's trying to study the issue, is how many guns own there, how many families, because you get, among other things, people who won't answer a survey question. You know, and they, there's a situation in, in Illinois in the 70s 
where the, the surveyors got a list of people who had an Illinois state government farms owner's identification card, which was necessary to, to own a gun. So they called people on, on the, the FOID card list, and they get people on the FOID card list who know that the government knows they have guns, and they still wouldn't tell a pollster. If you call a, a house and the husband answers, you will get a higher gun ownership rate than if the wife answers. It's just they, you know, people, and, and increasingly Republicans won't answer polls, so it gets harder and harder, and that, well, that, that's why some of the scholars go back to percent, of, percent gun suicide as their estimate for, you know, roughly how many guns are there in this general population. Let's go back here. Uh, would the United States homicide by firearms rate change significantly if we re removed cities like Chicago, Baltimore, and New Orleans? Um, yes, but you, I would, but there is also at least, I'm not sure for today's figures, but at least historically, uh, there has in some r rural areas, uh, the, the, the back country of South Carolina, for example, uh, been pretty high homicide rates there. Let me, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because the homicide rate in the United States is not evenly distributed. For middle class white people, has the homicide rate, you know, your, your chance of being the victim of a gun homicide gone up from 2010 to 2023? Yes, it has, but in, in a fairly small way. If you were a young black male in an urban area, it has skyrocketed. It is a huge, major cause of death, and it has returned to the terrible levels it was at at the worst of the 70s or the, around 1990. It is a catastrophe, and it's, it, it is not a, you know, it, it, that is the far and very horrible high end of the American gun homicide rate. And I will suggest that the, uh, Black Li the new Black Lives Matter Global Foundation, that scam organization run by self-proclaimed Marxists that has taken in so much money from useful idiots, has done more to cause the increased homicides against innocent black people than any organization in the, in the history of the United States. Way we're in, in, in terms of total number of black people, they're, they're responsible for killing. They are even worse than the Ku Klux Klan, and the Ku Klux Klan was very, very bad. The, the most homicide in the United States is intra-racial. It's, it's black, on, black on, you know, that, that's the majority. Um, so the vast majority of black people are killed by other black people. You know, the, the decent people in the neighborhood killed by that 19-year-old punk who 10 years ago with proactive policing might have been stopped by the police, but when you demonize the police, uh, cut their funding, drive the experienced ones, the veterans, into retirement, replace them with people for whom you lower the standards because that's all you can get is recruits, you have less effective policing. And again, that, the impact of that is heavily concentrated in those neighborhoods that need the policing the most. And if you look at polls of black people, they, you say, well, in your neighborhood, would you like to see more police, less police, or about the same? And the latest poll I saw was about 38% said more, about 38% that said the same, and only 23% said fewer. Questions. Go ahead, Daria. Is it an online question? No, I actually have my own question. Um, so I'm a student here, and so a lot of the discussions that we have about gun control, like with my with other education majors, yeah. are that the number of shootings keep increasing as the years go on. Yet I've also heard from other people um, that there were the same amount of mass shootings um, even like 50 years ago. So I was wondering if your research had showed anything on that. Well, let, let's, let's define mass shootings in the way that, that normal people do rather than people, than CNN. Um, 
there are some databases that will say every time you have three or more people shot, they call that a mass shooting. So somebody robs a liquor store, sh shoots and, and injures the two clerks and one customer, they call that a mass shooting. That seems, that's, it, it's obviously a serious crime, but that's not what most people think of as mass shootings. And I'd say that kind of thing I just described is something that, you know, we can talk about that going up and down in conjunction with the homicide rates in general and the overall levels of violent crimes. When we're talking about things like Columbine, uh, mass attacks in, in public places and schools and things like that, there has certainly been an increase in the, uh, in the last 25 years. And it is, among the other causes, is a social contagion effect. You know, you, you see that, that happen. There's, there's lots of social contagions in the world, and this is one of them. And I remember after uh, Columbine, uh, the week after Time and Newsweek put both of the, the two criminals on the front cover. And that kind of media coverage has absolutely been shown, did inspire many, many others. And you can go through a litany of mass shooters and find how carefully they study previous mass shooters, how they have their collections of newspaper clippings of all the previous ones, and that's gotten worse and worse and worse. Yes, Ms. Ramey, we're bringing the microphone over to you. Hi, Dave, Ramey Johnson. You thank you for your service in the legislature. Thank you. You mentioned some drugs, but you did not mention marijuana. And then I have a question for Jeff. Does CCU have a policy for uh, carrying weapons here on the campus? And do you have classes in shooting by any chance? I'll let you answer first. Yeah. So. Our policy is to not have weapons on campus as of right now. And so we do have armed guards, uh, Lakewood Police Department that protect our students and, and faculty that are on campus. And we do not have classes right now for shooting, but not something to be dismissed. I like that idea. <laughs> One of your uh, peer institutions, Hillsdale College, now has its own range on campus. So I'm, I'm just saying <laughs> if you want to... You, you want to keep up in the facilities race, uh, maybe that's your next project. No, I, I didn't mention marijuana, and, and I, uh, obviously there are, marijuana can be sometimes harmful for people who were on the mental edge, um, but overall I don't think uh, marijuana has a strong correlation with, uh, with violent crime. It's not, a, it's not a, you know, something that makes you lazy, and eat a bunch of Cheetos while you watch Netflix is <laughs> keeping people home and harmless. It's not, an, it's not a violence disinhibitor uh, the way alcohol, uh, among other things, clearly is. And, I don't want, and I'm not in favor of alcohol prohibition either. You know, I'm, alcohol's got a much stronger link to violent crime than almost anything else, any substance people consume. But I think the, the harms of alcohol prohibition far exceed the benefits. Um, and it's not fair to legitimate users of alcohol to prohibit it. Over here. To me, it's pretty clear when I read the Second Amendment that I have the right to bear arms. What do you think the chances are? We have idiots in the legislature which will, they will not pay any attention to the, the reality and, and true language. What are the chances in the ju judiciary in, uh, in Colorado, and then in a broader sense, eventually we get to the Supreme Court. What would you think the the, um, the, the, the that somebody at some point will say? Well, wait a minute. Let's let's look at the true language in the in the Second Amendment. Well, first I'll answer for our Colorado state courts. Our, our Colorado Constitution of 1876 uh, took the strongest right to arms language they can find in any state constitution, which was Missouri's 1875 revision, and they made it even stronger than that. The right of no person to keep and bear arms in defense of home, person, or property, 
or in aid of the civil power, when thereto legally summoned, shall be called into question, but nothing herein shall, shall be construed to justify the carrying of concealed arms. So in Colorado, you've got a right to bear, a constitutional right to bear arms openly. Concealed carry is a matter of legislative decision. And as far as the keeping side uh, or the open bearing side, it seems pretty much off limits to uh, legislative interference because the shall not be questioned language was copied from the recently enacted article, section four of the 14th Amendment, which is the debt of the United States shall not be questioned. You know, the federal government can't repudiate the debt. They can't do it. It's, it's an impossible act for the federal government to do, acting lawfully under the Constitution. And that's the standard they chose for protecting the right to arms. However, our Colorado Supreme Court uh, knows better and has, in, in 2020, announced a decision that um, all reasonable gun control laws are constitutional and a challenger can only succeed and to find a gun control unreasonable, a challenger has to prove it unreasonable beyond a reasonable doubt and must prove that the law makes it impossible uh, for people to defend themselves. So if you banned 90% of gun models, well, there'd still be 10% left and the Colorado, current Colorado Supreme Court uh, might well uphold that. Um, federally, it's a more mixed bag. The, the Supreme Court just in 2022 issued a strong uh, decision in the Bruin case on the right to bear arms, um, and lots of cases are being litigated now. You, and you know, in, so far you win some, you lose some, uh, but, but at least it's a reasonable fight in the, in the federal judiciary these days. Well, David, I wanna thank you very much for coming up here to Colorado Christian University. This is a special tie designed by each president that has 1776 on it, the spirit that we get to uh, embrace and support up here. So can we give uh, Dave Koppel another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And that is a beautiful tie. <laughs> I, will wear with I appreciate it. Well, friends, the Western Conservative Summit's only about 10 weeks away. So it's coming up very, very closely. Ticket sales will increase in price on April 17th, after April 17th, so make sure you get your passes before then. We are talking with a lot of people, a lot of more speakers to be announced. We traditionally have over 50 speakers. Join us at the summit, 25 national organizations that will be a part of it, 60 exhibiting partners. So it really is a wonderful event. We as conservatives need this in this state. Uh, we need a moment to get together, to be together, to be inspired for the founding principles that make America great. So I hope you will join us this year, June 9th and 10th, Colorado Convention Center, westernconservativesummit.com. Thank you to all who came out here, joined us in person, and thank you to all you online. God bless you, David. Thank you thank again. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Take care.